as we begin to go live, live on YouTube. Welcome to the 22nd episode of Born in Trouble. I'm your host, John X. How y'all feeling today? It's a great day in the moment. Feeling wonderful. Really Excellent. wonderful. Excellent. So tonight, I'm going to introduce first, from the A, Mr. Dub K, Mr. Gene Hopkins. Hey, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm about to put this on my tagline during your introduction, but I got to get it right first. So when the Panthers have somebody, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's somebody, I don't know his name. He's, I'm sure it's one of you guys are going to tell me though. And I mean, and he yells out at the end of his, uh, speech, excited speech, my black, be back, you know, like three things. And that's like, kind of like his war cry. Uh, you, 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 you know what I'm talking about? Wood? I don't, I don't know who, but I'm, I, I think yeah. I'm. I'm going to learn that, and that's that's going to be, that's like what Grant says, come on that's down. Is that Stokely? Huh? That is may that Stokely? Have, it may have been. I'm not sure, but I know that uh, a lot of people use that clip, you know, for some of the reels and stuff. But, yeah, hey, how's everybody doing from the A? That's what's up from the A. And, of course, we're going to go second with the City Wing King. City Wing what up, King. Though? Mr. Grant Lancaster. How you feel, baby boy? You know, you know, everything is everything. We're just doing our thing. And a new guest to the show. He's not actually new to the show because I got to explain to y'all. Reggie Reg, Reggie Wood, has been doing our show, has actually been on our show for the past two weeks. But your boy has had technical difficulties for... The past two weeks. So, for the first time, let's give a big shout out to Mr. Reggie Wood. You're trying to, you're trying to mess up my uh, residual money, I guess. Put that's me on a delay. Is. That's so what it is. So I, so I can't cash in on uh, the plays and listens and all of that stuff. I that's, see. That's what it is. That's a, that's that Ohio play you when you're always talking about that money. <laughs> Mr. Reggie Wood. <laughs> Oh, good evening, good evening uh, brothers. Evening. A big shout out to my boy, Mr. Rob Brooks, right now tonight. He's out there working with the Philadelphia Phillies. Hopefully. Man, um, the boys. Yeah, I can't. The boys put some money in my pocket. Yeah, I can't say I can't say good luck to the Phillies because it's against my DNA code as a Met fan. But I can say good luck to Mr. Brooks with the good looks. May you get richer and richer. Richer and richer. The brother may need to borrow some money. So yeah, anyway. So anyway, fellas, we're going to get right into it. Born in trouble. We don't miss two weeks. We don't miss two crazy weeks. We've had the whole world going upside down. Israel, Palestine. Um, <sighs> we've talked about this on the show. But we're going to get to that later. Tonight's topic I would like to get into is context. That's right, context. The reason why I want to have this conversation brings us back to the whole reason why we do this show, which is that we like to bring context to the real world as it is today, as it was before. And I was on the internet the other day, and I was looking at a post, and it was about this chick that they called Sexy Red in in the 70s. And she was 16 years old, worked for the Franks, Lucas, and um, I forget the other one. But uh, by the time she died, at the age of 16, her family found $4 million in her condo in Riverdale. Riverdale in the Bronx is still an expensive neighborhood today. Riverdale would probably cost you about, for a condo there, it's about a million and a half, maybe two. And she was like a hardcore dealer, hardcore street person in 1970 when she passed away and she passed away she was a heroin dealer she was working but I I was reading this comment about her on Twitter these comments about her on Twitter and they broke down like you know Twitter glorifies everything it glorifies white supremacists it glorifies like black culture rap culture country stuff that you never even heard, heard about ever before in your life 
it, there's a glorification for everything. So this is the glorification of what was going on in Harlem in the early 70s and the 80s. And the comment was that in the description, they said, like, every drug dealer, every major drug dealer at the time wanted to get with this woman because she was so beautiful. And one of the people commented, so it's okay for everyone just thinks it's okay for all these grown ass men to be wanting a 16 year old woman. I thought about it myself and I thought about it in terms of 1970 and everything. A female who is amassing 300,000 hours a month, taking her students on, taking her fellow classmates and teachers on shopping sprees, has a $4 million stash out in a um, condo. If you were to take your time travel and take your 2023 ass, 27, 28, 29 year old ass, and go and meet that woman in 1970, would you call her a girl per se? Is she really a girl at that point in time? That's the work of someone who is a beast. It's someone beyond her time. Whether you whether you respect the game or you don't respect the game, you feel like selling drugs was a sellout to the neighborhood at that point and broke down the culture and the whole nine yards, whatever you feel about it. But what makes a 27-year-old, 30-something-year-old person today think that they could actually stand in the shoes of a 16-year-old girl who was going through all those different things at that point in time? And is that girl per se, at that time, a woman, could she, would she exist in this time? What do y'all think about that in terms of context? It was different then. Yeah, it was, it was different then, man. Like we prolong adolescence now, you know what I mean? So are we not as grown as our ages necessarily where back then I mean, at 16, she could have had an apartment by then. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, in, in the 70s, she could she could have been on her own at 16. I mean, uh, and there's kids that are on their own now, but, like, she could have, like, really been on her own. Like, her parents was, was cool with it. You know what I mean? Like, she could have been married and the whole shit at 16 back then. Right. Different time. Different time. Different age. Completely different time. When you think about it in context that... If you were 21 years old at that point in 1970 and you were a female and you weren't married, you're somewhat looked at as almost an old maid. Marriage, women were supposed to be married before 25 years old. They were out there doing all different types of stuff, following bands. You watch all these these rock bands mm-hmm. and talk about all these groupies that were 13, the, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old and everything. In context, this is not the same world that we used to that they used to live in and that she used to exist in. So I I just take it that everybody feels as if what's going on today is something that it wouldn't be acceptable today when in reality you'd probably die for expressing some of the points of view that you express today freely. Am I wrong? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, hundred percent right. I would think if she was in the game like that, that you know that other side of this, along with what Graham was just talking, and you, the time period, and uh, the, the views towards uh, you know like societal roles and whatnot. Like I said, I, I'm guessing she was pretty advanced uh, in, in that day and age, and has seen quite a bit. Uh, I think you even mentioned it in one of these last two weeks that I said in. Maybe, uh, John, maybe you mentioned something about families having more children to do to spread the work around and for there to be more while earning, you know, money and stuff for the family. Right. So, yeah, I feel like I would have been hard pressed to kind of weigh in on that. And, and, And I think all of this. This now, you know, how we are, I mean, I, I know all the, the trafficking, the sex trafficking stuff is going on, but I think that's kind of where we've matured as a uh, as a society where, like Grant was saying, you got a few more years now. You might get up to 22, 23 where you can still be the, the baby, you know, of the family. Right. 
They're they're trying to push the 27, 28, 29. They're 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 not in the same thing. And my whole thing is that the whole thing about the arrogance of, of this woman to actually say this because it, 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 to me it wasn't about what she was doing or who she was choosing to spend her time with at night. That's like basically her parents' decision at that point in time. Yeah. But, but what it was to me is that they're taking it, she took it, and the way that these people were phrasing what she was experiencing as if she was some type of victim of what was going on in her life. This is a 16-year-old woman who, in the middle of, like, the roughest time in New York City, New York City ain't rough no more. We joke about it all the time. Like, you know, they talk about these these robberies that happen on the subway and stuff like that. That was Monday, you know? Right. Wednesday, Friday, you know, mm-hmm. you, had, you had to... There was a test on every fucking corner. You understand what I'm saying? And what it did to me was, like, I felt bad for I felt that they were taken away from her accomplishments as, a, as an individual. Because no matter what, sure, I mean, it's terrible. You know what I'm saying? You're selling heroin, and, you know, they, they label a, um, a drug in called DOA after you. But... The accomplishments that she made at such a young age and to take that away from her and make her a victim of like men, that's part of the problem with like today's society. I sent you all that that article about the uh, Michigan state coach, right? Mm -hmm. You can tell I'm a little bit rusty. I'm, I'm like stuttering a little bit tonight, but we saw what happened. And I had to put what was what's that coach's name again? Grant, do you know the coach's name? Mel. Mel Tucker. Mel Tucker. All right. We we joked about Mel a couple of weeks ago, right? It was about a month ago. We had a good mm-hmm. laugh at Mel's expense. What are you doing whacking off with somebody who is a sexual survivor of a terrible act? And then it turns out that her friend and assistant dies, and all this information comes out about how she was basically playing it up, how she's been dating a married man. And this is what women say, well, now she's the one that she's on um she's on blast now. We don't want to victimize the victims. But is she a victim? Mel lost a very lucrative job. And it looks like he's getting paid every every dime of that contract now. It was well, that's- reading through that man. Go ahead, go ahead, Grant. Yeah. No, I was just gonna say that was the whole point of what we were talking about when we were talking about Mel Tucker was like, how, how did the message get so misconstrued between the two people? Mm -hmm. Right. That was my point. Like, how do you think that what she's talking about not, and not knowing what she's talking about, how do you, why do you think that what she's talking about as a sexual survivor is the time for you to start beating off? Right. Right. That was like, a joke, right. Right. Yeah. Like why, why, why is that? The, how is that the connection? But now here you go. Right. An article comes out, get a little more information. You get a little further from, from the, from the, you know, the, the blast. And now you start getting more information mm-hmm. and maybe, maybe he will, maybe he will get that bread. I think he is going to get that bread. I think it's, it's owed to him at this point. I have a completely different point of view on that whatsoever. It's just, it reminds me of something that Ark had told me like years ago. You remember Ark from yep. Howard? And, uh-huh. And he was working at his company and and they had someone new who had came into the job and this woman had been a um, high, she had been a high paid um, stripper at a strip club and she had worked her way through and now she was doing tech stuff. And she kept sending emails to different people offering different sexual things in hopes that someone would send it back to her so that way she could file a sexual harassment suit. And eventually somebody bid on it. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this is like the this is the landscape that we've created for women right now. And there's no way to discuss this without sounding like you're attacking women. And it's just crazy to me, like, and, and I'm assuming he just, he might've been a workaholic. I know these, these, uh, 
you know, that coaching game is a 24 hour job, seven days a week, 365, you know, and all of that. But so I'm sure it was convenient. It was right there in his face, but it's like, you didn't notice the hustle that was going on in this, Mm. all of this, all of this time talking and, um, you know, exchanging text messages and whatnot. Like he didn't realize he was being gamed. The one thing that stood out to me in reading through some of that was that she was supposedly like down to her last five dollars mm. and had to get about twenty five thousand dollars together in six weeks with some IRS troubles that she had. Mm. And so it's like you sitting here. I, I believe Mel Tucker is married. I think he got a family and whatnot. Yep. Maybe, yeah, you, you know, and then you're a leader of, of all these young men in this room, and you're just sitting here getting victimized by Brenda yeah. Tracy, who has way more game than what he was giving her credit for having. You know what? You make a very good point because I, I can sit here and I can say all these things about her all day long, but he's a married man, he's supposed to know better. He really is not supposed to be involved. You're not supposed to put yourself in that situation in the first place. So had he not been that been in that situation in the first place, we don't have anything to talk about. Like really, Gene, you don't really have much to say tonight. Are you still there, Gene? Well, no. Well, the the topic I'm not up on. I mean, okay. I saw the video. I mean, I'm a little familiar with it, but not enough to think that I'm speaking intelligently, but I don't know, you know, that you put that, you can put that on the shelf with so much other shit that basically people ask, ask for these things, you know, mm. <laughs> you find yourself but, in that situation, you ask for it. <laughs> you ask for but, it but, so, so here's what I'll say though. Men, when men like somebody like, that just kind of is what it is. You know what I'm saying? Regardless to the situation, she could work at McDonald's. She could, whatever her flaws are, she have eight children by nine different dudes. Whatever the situation is, if a dude like her, right, he just likes her. And typically as men, if we like somebody, that's just kind of, I don't want to say full steam ahead, but it's like we'll we'll ignore a lot of things that we probably should see. I don't think women are really like that. I think women are much more calculating when they like, or when they purport to like somebody, I think they like us differently than we like them. I think we like them more genuinely than they like us. You know what I mean? I I think that, I think, I think that we, we, we are unconditional. Most no, of man, the you need to write some memoirs because that's you, bro. <laughs> that's no, you. I'm, you're I'm good, saying I'm just, I'm just saying dude. by and large. You're I'm just dude. saying by and large. I'm not saying me necessarily, but I'm just saying by and large. No, you're because a good dude. How could you be? How could you be? How could you be Mel Tucker and knowing that you got eighty million dollars on the table, it's, and you go through this situation? Like it just it just don't make sense. To to be in this situation, if you if you got that much money on the table, how do you spend that much time in the text. in the text game and on the phone? Yeah, you like, know they were listening. You know they watching. Ha, ha. I don't even we got to do everything face to face, like Marlo and and and, and, and Avon and all that. Like NDS is <laughs> look, it, look NDAs on site. Yeah, NDAs like, on site every meeting. <laughs> this, this was a thing of this was a matter of convenience, and where she had to come to the school, uh, I think once or twice, and she was right there for him. He didn't have to. He didn't have to get up out of his seat. He didn't have to get dressed up. He didn't have to do nothing. It was just right in front of him, and it became a thing. And sometimes that that ease of convenience and whatnot, like Grant saying, that should have been a dead giveaway, like. Well, you might need fruit. you might need you one in Iowa and one in Minnesota and Minnesota one in in Wisconsin right. Out yeah. on the road, but right here in front of you and and then he had her I don't know how much y'all read into that article but he had her come in town for uh 
and made her like the honorary captain mm-hmm. spring game or something. And it, it and that those are these are like dead giveaways that something more is going on besides her just here speaking to the young men and doing what she's supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. And it, it's this kind of reminds you know me. I don't know what yeah, she was watching. We but can say that now though. That what I'm saying is we can say that now. So when uh who who was it that had uh the little high price hoe that wrote the book? What's her name? Um Brittany Renner. Brittany Renner. Who was it that had her speaking to his players? Was that Dion? That was Dion yeah. at yeah. Jackson. Right. So she was she was homecoming right. queen at Jackson, you know. Right. But you didn't but Dion I I think Dion is smart enough to know, like regardless of how he felt about her. I'm not. Even, I'm not even gonna entertain nothing from from her. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm. I'm. I'm not gonna put myself in no kind of situation where anything could come back. Everything is being done out in public, mm-hmm. right? There are no text messages between you and I. Everything is a phone call. Everything is a. You know what I mean? Like it's it's face to face. You come. We we'll meet at the coffee shop. You know what I'm saying? We ain't meeting. You ain't coming to my crib. I ain't coming to your crib. You ain't coming to my office and closing the door. It ain't none of that. Well, that's because Dion understands that there's a level of accountability that comes with him that most people aren't aware of because he's been in the NFL and he's been Dion Sanders since he was 18 years old. Um, Mel hasn't had that type of attention. That $80 million, that was something that was brand new. This is like new money for him. He don't know how to behave. Yeah, he he don't know how to behave necessarily. In those situations, it's like it's all new to him. It's like when you go to the club after you get that number one hit record, and all the girls are like, "Hey, I want to jump in the limo with you." You know, right. if you're not smart, yeah. you're gonna end up with a 15 year old girl in the back of a limo. Mm-hmm. You know? this, he still really, he still really didn't do anything to squander his whole back, which is why after the fact. When he goes and fights for this, he's probably gonna get the majority of this because they were wrong and how and what they acted on, which really is the big the, the, the major twist in this thing that that money gone. That money ain't gone. Yeah. That, money, that, money, that, money, that, money, that money that money probably gone. That I don't think so. they, they, on, on the heels. He, listen, on the heels of all this gymnastics, I'm telling on the heel of all this gymnastics shit. Yeah, all this me it's too. He's married. I'm telling you, he's he's screwed because he's married. Okay. I, you know, he, and no he more, he's he screwed because wife, he's black. Though. Now he's trying all this shit as a black man. He didn't <laughs> cheat on his wife. Huh. Well, did he? Did he cheat on his wife? I mean, no. we don't know via the text. What you? Hold on, is he married sh- to? Is I, he married to a black woman? <laughs> I don't know. I assume so. Well, I, I, if, if he's married to a black woman, it was cheating. <laughs> Damn! This, but this mine though. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is mine though. <laughs> I promise you. So, 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 she mad at Rosie Paul? I'm just saying. Oh man, look, yeah, because he was thinking about the next one when he was, you know, it's cheating. I'm telling you, if he married. But, any, it's, I don't you know what's going to hold up in the court of law, though, Gene. It's, it's, no, no, yeah. I, I'm, unless, I'm they kidding, the, but it's, unless they get an all black jury. He may, she, look, let me tell you something. The thing, the well, thing she yeah. mad at is that it happened. Yeah, the thing exactly. she mad at is that it, is that it came embarrassed. out. She's embarrassed. Uh, all that money don't stop the embarrassment because you, you probably got roots in different circles that establish real quickly and. And in those circles, you really do care about perception and reputation and everything else. And I, c- I can't, even, you know, it, uh, all that's dead. But there's a, there's an upside in her favor. Man, she has she has the, she has an ironclad claim <laughs> to all to half of all monies made. <laughs> going forward. But here's the thing. She is secure. She is secure. She's gonna stick she's gonna stick with him during the fight because while they're fighting for those dollars, 
The only thing I can think of is, like you said, Gene, is a um, one of those clauses a morals clause, you know, a um, that yeah. is based upon how you behave while you're a coach. It's the, it's the optics, man. Right. It's the optics. I mean, how can you have? How can you? How are you gonna put him there or pay him after? Even at, at the very least, you now have a hand jacker. <laughs> That's representing your school, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, you you can't get these things out of people's head. Oh, yeah, dude is hey, cool. Dog. Yeah, you know he be jerking off, though, right? Yeah, he cool, though, you know what I mean? But, he's but, a great but coach. Who don't? Yeah, but he jerks off. But, t- but tell, me what, tell me what coach don't, though. <laughs> yeah, no, but no. But you just got, look, it's, it's, it's a beautiful sight. When it's just said in a cliche, and you know everybody does it, but you don't have to visualize it. You know what I'm saying? But the cat's out the bag with old boy. I don't have to visualize it with Mel Tucker. No, nah, oh. no, nah, you know, I'm just talking about, I'm talking about like yeah. people that they, they want to make money yeah, off you. of. You know what I'm saying? You know, it, it's, I think it's enough. I, I don't think, you know, you know, schools are supposed to be representing wholesomeness. Most of them represent white Jesus and his people and they're not, you know, they're just not wanting to see any of that. They want to get, you know saying? They want to keep the, the evil under a lid. They Reg, don't Reg, like you had something you, Reg, you had something you want to say? But this is the thing, like, I, I watched the biggest, the biggest longest running lie in college football this past weekend when Fox was here in Columbus, Ohio, and you have Urban Meyer sitting here on the panel, and we all know his business. Mm. We all know his business. It was it was caught on yeah. t- all the stories out there, all his all his hirings, his whole debacle. Mm-hmm. And he's sitting here on the table giving his picks and breaking down the game this past Saturday, like ain't nothing happened. So I, I like it's all good. Like it's all good. So I really don't see. I really don't see how. I really don't see how Mel Tucker doesn't get forty five to sixty of of that eighty that was due to him. Mm. He buy a lot of lotion with that too, so that's a good thing. Come on, yeah. He might be able to launch his own brand, you know. Yeah. <laughs> lotion, right? Jerky, you know, M- MT jelly, jerky. He'd be on shark, He'd be on shark yeah. tank. Like, no hand, no handshakes. What's up, about, yo? Right. You know, they got he, they all gonna they gonna have a classification for. All them folks and Deshaun Watson gonna be in it too, and uh, and all I can say is they, they wrote a song, uh, old school group. I really love wrote a song about them cats right there, you know. Mm. And it's uh, she turns me on and on. <laughs> all of Carla all. Funkadelic. What the fuck? <laughs> they go in the freak of the week folder. <laughs> go ahead, throw them Man. in there. I gotta Man. tell you, there's just some subjects that we should not discuss on Born in Trouble because it's obviously gonna go wrong. Because I, I'm thinking about in terms of all of these more important things, like we and we started on the right path. We started on the right path, but now we're talking about rubbing. Nether parts and all that stuff. So we're no, gonna have on. to. We're gonna have to just leave. You know this what the old people say? If his hand was sandpaper, his dick would be a pencil. Somebody, <laughs> <laughs> he got a number two pencil. <laughs> thinking about a, thinking about a woman getting abused or something. Man, that, 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 that's, 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 that's layers of sickness. Ain't nobody gonna ask Coach to use his phone to call a ride home. Either. Yeah. <laughs> no more daps. We don't want no daps. You know what I'm saying? Elbow uh, bump. Bro. So even when so I guess the synopsis is that even when it comes out that the brother may have been bamboozled, he still can't it's not a good look either way because of what he was doing. It just it's not gonna work out for him. I I don't think it's so much because of what he was doing though. No, you know what I mean, I, nah. It, it will it boils down to what we see, and what we see is a black dude mm. that they don't want to be in that place because 
Pee Wee Herman was able to come back. Bill Clinton actually cheated on his wife. Look, look Marv Albert. Yeah, like in the, in the public eye. Yeah. That's what I'm I mean, saying. Just... Bobby Petrino, Coutinho, Rick Pitino, all of these guys have been able to come back. He's not wrong. All those guys can come back. And who was it, Grant? You sent that that um, message this week with the guy that was in yeah, that was, with that was uh, yeah, Deontay Whitfield. Okay, and what was that he said? He was like, he was saying he was basically saying that uh, um, black men or white men, when they have a concern, somehow it's immediately addressed, mm-hmm. right? With a policy, it, right? With a policy or something. But black men, when they when they have an issue, they're told to just go back into the situation. That ain't what you. That ain't really what's going on. Just going back to work or whatever the situation is. And I, I, that's that's wild paraphrasing, but that's pretty much what it was saying. Has anybody on this panel ever experienced anything like that? Where you've been in the same situation? You know what? That's even a dumb question for me to ask. I should just be asking, like, what is your story of an experience in that space? where you actually um, said the same thing or were in the same situation as someone who wasn't white and your stuff got pushed to the side. And this is what... (sighs) I'm trying to find the right way to phrase this and how to like really segue to this because we've talked about it the last two couple of weeks that no one actually got a chance to hear. But it seems like what's going on in this world with the um, war in Palestine and Israel and the um, way people are trying to push it so that way you have to support one side. Forget about one side or the other. You have to support one side. Um, The hypocrisy of the situation is just like, it just hasn't sat well with my soul. I'm not going to lie. It hasn't sat sat well with me because it kind of goes against everything that I, as a person, have always been about. Like, I always tell you the story about how I fought every kid in my neighborhood when I was young because they used to call me Mr. Spock because if there was a rule and the rule went against me or went against one of my teammates, I was still going to say that's the rule and that's the way we do it. You know, because I just, I'm one of those assholes. I can never be a cop. Because they would murder me. They would have murdered me on the, like, you know, second or third week on the job. Because they're, like, you know, you're you're too by the book. You're trying to, like, actually do things the way they're supposed to be. And I actually feel that if you take one thing and you apply it to one person and you don't apply it to the other, that hypocrisy is just basically, it's like, to me, it's like mind-numbing. I can't do it. And that's basically what this entire world is based upon those hypocrisies and the hypocrisy of what's going on where Palestine was basically held in, uh, you, you look at the narratives from over the years in the seventies, you have president Carter wrote a book about Palestine and how he felt like Israel was mistreating the Palestinians. And you move forward to 2023 And anyone who says anything like that is automatically, like, shunned. Even Mm -hmm. having a conversation is, it's a shunning conversation. It's like, it's like the number of people that I know in the Jewish community that have taken it, a couple of my people, it's not proportionate. Even if these acts were done, what's happening right now is not proportionate to what was done to them. And it's just such a hard thing to watch, especially as a black American, knowing that we've actually like we're in the state of apartheid here. We have always had we always have a level of apartheid here. There's always a glass ceiling that's above you somewhere. There's always a a door that's closed to you somewhere. It may not be as it may not be as prevalent. It may not be as like, you know, but, but it's there. These things exist. And. To see what's going on with these people and to see, like, how... I I was trying to think of a metaphor. And I was thinking, like, about, like, you know, one of my friends that I know. It's like, I know this guy every day, and it's like I see him every day. And we're really good friends, but as we're walking down the hallway, 
we pass someone every day and he punches that person in the face every day. Not for any reason, just because of the fact that he just doesn't like the look of him. He doesn't like the feel of him. He doesn't like what he might become one day. And at that point in time, if you're friendly with the bully at that point in time, then you're basically assisting the bully in what they're doing. And that's the way I look at the situation. This is not a war in Israel. This is a walkthrough. Israel has the United States of America on their side, and they bought a ship in there with laser capabilities to shoot down anything that's shot in Israel's direction. They're not going to be shooting down those same missiles that go out towards those other countries. So it's really the United States against anybody in the Middle East that wants to, like, get fucked with. That's what it is right now. And it just doesn't sit well with me, and it doesn't sit well with me to keep my mouth shut when I see these people dying. I don't know if y'all want to comment on that or not. I understand if you don't. I don't well, even want to talk about it, but it's just like I can't be I can't be genuine and not talk about it. So 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 I'm gonna give you two things. Uh, so my son or uh, Gil's uh, my stepson, but I raised him. So I'm just giving you context. Uh, he has a job with uh, NPR. And so, uh, you know, he's been doing stories and stuff and, you know, basically cutting his teeth with them and, and that kind of journalism. And they sent him to talk to a, a rabbi. Mm-hmm. And so he was telling me that he went in there and the rabbi was so my word, theatrical, uh, his word, emotional (laughs) and, and saying that he asked the rabbi, you know, what, what are some of the possible things that could be done, you know, to work towards an understanding this, that, everything else or, or peace or, and, uh, he said, before he could even finish, the rabbi was shaking his head like, and said, I don't want to talk about nothing till those hostages are back because when he first asked the rabbi, you know, how you doing these days before he got into the question is he, he also said the rabbi said, Oh, not good. That's why I called it theatrics <laughs> where he calls it, uh, you know, where he was describing it as emotion. Okay. So take that. And I'm, I'm just pointing that out to say that that's probably not a one-off. Okay. That's probably, you know, this this is a rabbi in a big organization here in Atlanta or whatever. And I don't even know if my son's going to run the story or stuff. So I'm just kind of being vague about that or if they're going to run the story. Now, I was listening to Umar, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you, I love that brother. I don't care nothing about whatever with the school, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt with that. Meaning there's shit I don't know or people don't know or whatever. But anyway, I love the way he speaks truth to supposed power. So Umar was like, look, man, what's happening in Palestine isn't the biggest thing, isn't the biggest humanitarian crisis on earth. A much bigger and longer one that's happening right now is in the Congo. And then he repeated it again. And so basically he was saying like that other lady that I sent to the group chat was saying was, look, you know, this, we got a lot of concerns, but this ain't one of them for us. Mm. And, you know, these are, these, you know, these are his messages and, and another person's messages. And mm. I kind of see where they're coming from. Now the lady, she was raw about, it. you know, I'm going to summarize hers to look both people on both sides of the fence were heavy participants and and enslaving black folks and the whole transatlantic slave trade. And she talked about Sunnis and Mm -hmm. and the Jewish people and the roles the Sunnis had and the roles the Jewish people had. So maybe paraphrasing her words, one of the devils is getting their ass with right now. Why are we pouring energy into that when we have long lists of things that affect us, you know, uh, right now that we can be pouring energy in uh, and stuff like that. And so, so I'm just saying all that to say that I kind of, you know, I, I try not to have 
too much co- cognitive dissonance. Like when I'm presented with new information, mm-hmm. I, I'm trying to turn into water. And you know what? That those were two perspectives I hadn't even considered until I heard it come from them. And now that I heard, it, and, it, and, and it immediately resonated with me. So how I feel about it. Good luck. Same way they told us in the crack Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Good luck, you know, the same way we've been told good luck, you know, in that, in that respect so many times and so many points of history and stuff like that. I'm going to start saying it now. Good luck. So here's the difference though. The difference is even being told, even though we've been told good luck, right? Yeah us telling other people good luck, we still have that empathy for those people. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I and, and we talked about this last week. I don't, I don't, I try to care about what's going on in, in Palestine and Gaza and all that, but miss me with it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like it, it, I hear, I get it, but I'm not really affected by it, but my heart goes out to the people you see what I'm saying? Because I I don't like the people, the, the people are the ones that's going to suffer mm-hmm. regardless of what happens with the land and the countries and all that. The innocent people that are going to suffer are the ones that my heart goes out to. Mm-hmm. And that's traditionally what's happened to black folks mm-hmm. is that the innocent have suffered. Mm-hmm. But when they tell us, when they tell us good luck with that, they don't have that same empathy toward us. Mm. You see what I'm saying, it's, and, it's, and that, that's that's the difference. I, I right. could feel that, like, Grant. Right, I could feel that. Like, I'm just gonna say I don't even think they bother saying good luck with that anymore. <laughs> right. Mm. <laughs> right. Same job. Yeah. Uh huh. I got a caveat to that though, Grant. Yeah, I have empathy for ones who would have empathy for me and mine. Thank you. Right. Thank you. But I'm for that too. You know, and so, so I, I mean, I, you know, I do. Meaning, you know, uh, I, I would like to think that I'm a humanitarian overall. Like, I'm not just going to leave somebody just lying and hurting if I have the power to help them. You know, now I'm not just taking bullets for anybody. <laughs> Silly there right now. Right. You know? <laughs> but, but you know, and I general generally wish well for, for any human. I don't well except those who are in the evil category, mm, you know, right. uh, and we'll just leave it at that. But, but so with that said, yeah, I have empathy for any of the people or organizations or, or, or organizations over there that were hurt and uh, they were actually trying to, uh, you know, produce some sort of love, in a humanitarian way, which would have included me and mine, if you know, if if that uh, situation presented itself. So, so yeah. But if it's just you know, strangers who don't even know anything about our plight, don't yeah. care to learn about our plight, mm-hmm. you know, and stuff, then that's where you know uh, I'm kind of like. A lot of these folks are saying, and and this, and you know, I, I kind of got the feeling that, uh, no, I'm done with that. Yeah, I'm that, done praying for folks. I'm done. I'm done with all that. That's, <laughs> and, that's just, and, right, and that's exactly right. where it. That's exactly where it lands because I can say that how I how I feel about seeing these people be oppressed and what's going on in that in the country of Palestine. But at the end of the day, I know just as many racist Arabs as I know racist Jews, racist. Uh, white people, racist Indians, there, and I just as I well as I know as many non-racist of each one of those groups. I can't get up. I can't get up and and jump up and say that I'm on one side or the other because I I can only deal with people that are on my side. If you don't give right. a fuck about what's going on with me and what's going on with mine's. And everything. I don't understand why you. Would, why is it so necessary for me to have a positive or affirmative position about what you're going through when you're not actively trying to? If you're not actively working towards my liberation, 
and my assistants, I can't I can't necessarily fuck with you on that level. You know what I'm saying? What am I supposed to tell you? What am I supposed to do for you, Reg? That's that's why Grant's uh, that DeAndre Whitfield clip that you that you sent. It just had me like uh, just spiraling uh, because, like Grant said, he was saying if a, if a if a if a white man has a grievance or complaint, it's a policy that's changed immediately. Uh, and then if you're black, if you're black, he said a black or brown man, he was like, you're told to go back to, uh, a pre, you know, to go back to where you came from or go back to a previous state or something, state of being. Mm -hmm. But I think what's where I'm kind of numb to everything is like, I feel like, cause the whole, I think that whole clip was something about a discussion on racism but it's like racism has us so jacked up here in this country that all at the same time, respectively, each one is each one of us is fighting our fight. But then at the same time, you're teetering over to your own people ostracizing you because you no longer in the struggle on the same level. As an as another brother, mm, right? So you, you got right. you just like so. I'm just like I'm. I'm kind of out here for myself and those that are trying to uh, those that I get a sense of are in a in a similar economic status or, or or standing, and and have like the same thing to lose. But you've also got the same skin in the game as me as what you overcome, you know, and fought for. And these the, the people like that just sit online and just second, second comment to you is, uh, you know, you a time or a sellout. And it's like, brother, what have you said? What have you done? What have yeah. you said? It's That's what, so, I'm, so I'm just kind of paralyzed in general, man, with, the, with this stuff. Grant, go ahead. What that's, were you saying? That's, that's unique to us though. That that's unique to that's why I'm paralyzed. FBA. It, that's unique to FBA in this country because we don't, we don't have a home. We don't have a home center, right? As, as a collective, we don't have a home center. Every, per, every, every descendant of slavery in this country, their home is like they're, they're when, if you reset them back to home, there's, there's not, there's no one else where you are. Right. Whereas if you reset these white folks back to home, there's they they from England, they from Ireland, they from uh, Australia, they from Germany. You know what I mean? We don't have a reset. You know what I mean? So so there is no. It's it's hard to think of us as a collective because we don't really have that. We don't have that collective experience. We don't e- we don't even have that to harken back to. Let me tell you what. Let me tell you what. Um, the reason why I led the show with uh, with the conversation about the young lady, in context, that is exactly what you're speaking to. That was 1970 Harlem. That was a culture thing. There were people that were wearing fur, fur coats and Cadillacs in the streets, and but also there were block parties. There were things that were between families that lived in the projects to help each other get by. And that collective struggle is what made mm-hmm. us what we were, were at that point in time. These people that are making comments about her life online have no context for what that type of community is like. It's the type of community that's like that has you resetting your family and moving from Brooklyn, like the Exums did, to Long Island and still going out to Brooklyn to be a part of that community. That's the type of community that we had. And, you know, um, just a, just a, and another thing in context with that, what I wanted to speak about with these people and how they were looking at her as being a victim at 16 years old and being preyed on by older men, quote unquote, older men. In 1970, being preyed upon by older men was a completely and totally different thing. 
first of all, we had families, we had brothers and sisters. And I was reading something else where somebody had shown that a guy, I was watching a guy getting molly whopped by, by a girl's brother because he hit on her and everything. And somebody put in a comment that this is how the brother's supposed to come back to that with two guns blazing. And I'm like, nah, the problem is that you shouldn't be hitting on that woman in the first place. Okay. You ain't supposed to be out there. And back in the day, I remember before my sister got married and she's been married to a great guy, her husband for over 25, almost 30 years now, they've been married. But I remember that conversation that me and my brother, me at 18 years old, you know what I'm saying? My big ass at 18 years old after helping her move her stuff out. And my brother, the Marine, who was home on leave, had a conversation with old boy and like, yo, listen, you know what I'm saying? We like you. We think you're a good guy and everything, but we just got to let you know. Don't let our sister call us. Don't let her call us. That's the Mm -hmm. way it was. That was the way the community was. You didn't have to worry about people like basically doing things against their will because if you did the wrong thing to the wrong girl, you might end up hanging from a tree. Mr. Brooks could tell you a story about his family that I know very well that I'm not going to indict anybody and all the parties are gone there. But I can tell you that there was somebody that didn't make it. You know, we didn't need the police. The police weren't in our neighborhood doing these things for us. There, there was no cases and everything. The case was that they find you someplace, you, or maybe they don't find you someplace you dump by the river. And everything. Context matters. That world was rougher in a lot of ways than it is today. So these statements about we are not our ancestors, your ancestors would whoop your asses. Period. They don't have gluten allergies. They don't have gluten allergies. (laughs) Nobody was allergic to peanut butter. You understand Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? My fuckers had jobs at 14, 15, 16 years old. You know what I'm saying? Y'all, yo, y'all need to learn about where you come from. And unfortunately, these neighborhoods that we came from have been gentrified. They have been taken over. Brooklyn is not Brooklyn now. Harlem is not Harlem now. You know, these places are not what they used to be. So it's up to us to actually give that information and let people know exactly where we come from and what we are. You know what I'm saying? That's all. Yeah. I think I think our in our zeal to be accepted by them, them being white folk, we have almost become them. Mm-hmm. And that's the biggest problem that we have. Because when we're playing in their field, we don't have their culture. We don't have their depth. And what it comes down to is the money. And the money is the one thing that has kept things like kept things the way they are. The only thing I'm going to say about, you know, listen, I'm going to wrap this show up, but um, we're going to wrap this show up because it's almost an hour, believe it or not. And before I even wrap this up, I'd like to say, yo, thank you. Thank you, brothers. All three of y'all have been here with me for the past two weeks. (laughs) <laughs> hey, X. Hey, be- before you wrap it up I, I want to share something that's in context to first grant was saying that uh we uh we don't have like a place like ireland this place that place right i was actually talking to this brother from senegal today and he he seemed like he was uh 40 maybe I don't know but he came over here when he was 19 and so you know now he's married with kids and everything else but he we were talking about first of all let me just say that he is the umpteenth person I talked to from Africa that has this heightened awareness about everything that's going on right now Mm mm-hmm and I always throw out the name like PLO Lumamba and the president of Kenya and, you know, people that I listen to and stuff, you know, because I'm hearing the same sentiment through the typical African that I'm running into and getting, and getting in a conversation with. Well, anyway, he, we 
started into the conversation and then it got into why Africa is inviting African Americans to come back and, you know, giving them citizenship and, and trying to, okay. and until he said it, I didn't even realize it. It's be, the, he said, the reason we need Amer- Americans to come back to Africa is because they have the skill sets that we we don't have the resources or haven't had the resources to gain. Mm-hmm. Whether mm-hmm. it's electrician, this, that, that. Look, he was saying that. I started scratching my head to think what kind of skills. <laughs> <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of skill sets do I have, right? <laughs> so, anyway, so anyway, he was saying, and, and so it made sense, you know, uh, that, you know, if, if you're like, you're an expert in HVAC and stuff like that. This might be the time or the window where the opportunity is ripe to, to man, just kind of fulfill destiny or whatever. And, 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 and I, th- I just really started thinking about it. Like, yeah, I would do that. But, you know, I got grandkids over here. I'm not doing, I'm not giving up. I mean, I'm just not going, you know, I, 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 now I live for my family, meaning that if shit come for me, that's cool. But, you know, I got to make sure all my effort goes towards these ungrateful motherfuckers. Mm. And so, (laughs) (laughs) but you know, I can't leave them, but yo, I was really thinking about that. Like, yo man, I mean, people be talking Exodus and stuff, religious nuts. And and every time they say it, I'd be like, yo, I'm down with that. Africa, Africa, Africa requires more than just skilled labor. Africa requires soldiers. It requires military expertise and military experts and a willingness to We have to that too. Fight the, well, you know. We have that too. But are we, How many black people don't went to the army? I'm they, one of them. Yeah, I know. But are, <laughs> but are they going to be loyal to, no, but are they going to be loyal to their new places? Because let's be honest, like I, we've said this before in the show, you go to Africa you move to Africa and you move your family to Africa, don't worry. You're going to see those people from the United States sooner or later because they can't survive without the resources. And they're going to have to start a war. They're going to, what we're seeing right now, what we're seeing right now in context is we're seeing the might of the military people and of the actual rulers of this earth right now. Okay. The people that have the money, there is a reason why Jesus was in the um, place throwing over all of the money changers' tables because money is the only allegedly. contract. Yeah, allegedly. Okay, allegedly. <laughs> because money is the only construct in this world that doesn't belong to nature. It just doesn't belong. It has no purpose. All it does is it's an ability to exert power over other people. When you take things and you assess a value to it and you provide them with money, then it takes away from the basic needs of man, which is food, clothing, and shelter. And when you give money in large amounts and you inherit money, then it generally gives you either a inflated sense of worth or a or it gives you an ability to not reach your full potential. Because there's no need for you to reach the full potential because your potential is in your bank account. Everything that you need is based upon money. So we have a serious problem on this planet with people who have more than they deserve or more than they've earned that were born into it. And the rest of us who are here possibly, who are here possibly to make the world a better place or maybe to make it like explode very quickly. Either way, we're not fine with me. Either way, it's fine with you. Either way, it's fine with me too. And you know, we, we just do, we get up and we do, and it's all based upon this fake construct that nobody really has an understanding of the actual value. If people were to say one day, if an army were to say, we don't want no paychecks anymore, we're just going to do whatever the fuck we feel like doing. Whatever's the right thing, it's going to well, change. John, change don't things. don't don't shit on my beautiful vision, man. If I want to have a beautiful vision, the black people throw up their middle finger, 
and say we're done here. Wakanda forever. And we're going to spend all our resources getting back to this and that, and, and we'll accept as much help as they're willing to provide on the other end and stuff. Man, let me have that vision, man. Don't start talking about how you got these it, folks going to start fighting it. He was like doing this and that and everything. Or the big bad white wolf gonna come get us when we get over there. None of that. You got it, bro. You got it. Thank you. From, a, from the A, Mr. Dub K. On a quiet tip tonight. Thanks to Mrs. Dub K. <laughs> of course. And my man. Reggie Wood, the host of what's the name of your podcast, the Boxing Podcast. You know, you you gave us a full breakdown. I want you to condense it now because we like you, bro. We want you to we want you to come back again, of course. But what is it that you do on your podcast, bro? So pay me no mind is the the, the conglomerate, I guess, the, the the umbrella, and that's just talking sports, entertainment. Uh, pop culture, whatever, whatever. And then bite down boxing is my boxing talk. But again, there won't be any boxing around after 2024. So, and this story. There ain't been boxing since the 90s. Yeah, so I, I push that to the side. But generally, Pay Me No Mind is uh, just me where I just go talk about what we just finished talking about. That's what's up. Well, we're, we're glad that you are that you came and you talked with us. And Reg... Yo, I'm going to throw you in the mix there. And, of course, from Detroit, Michigan, home of City Wings. That's 2896 West Grand Boulevard, Detroit, Michigan. Come down and get you some. Come and get you some Amish Wings, Mr. Grant Lancaster. That's right. Is it Rump Springer yet? We haven't talked about the Amish Wing Girls. No, no, recently. no, we haven't. No, no we, we haven't. haven't. We're going to skip it. We're going to get back to them you, at another time. You mentioned shunning earlier, which made me which made me go Amish, though. Oh. <laughs> <Don't get shunning. laughs> sure. Listen, man, and I just want to I just want to put it out there like at the end of the podcast. Um I had some problems on my Born in Trouble page where I got um, reported for some nonsense. I I feel like some of it is based upon my views of just being like, you know, there is no right side and wrong side in that Israel-Palestinian situation. And honestly, I don't really, I don't want to say I don't care per se, but I don't have a horse in that fight. I've said this before. I don't have a horse in that fight. I hope y'all get your shit together and you do whatever it is you're going to do. I do know a lot about the region, but I'm not going to talk about that on this podcast because you know what? We don't need to know that. We got other things that there are more pressing issues here with black people, with American people. That is much, that's much more important to me than what's going on in Palestine right now. And, you know, I, I really wish that those people get their thing together. I hope the Palestinian people actually live and find a way out, find a way out of it. But um, it just is what it is, man. Born in trouble. We're going to see y'all next week. And we wouldn't be born in trouble if I didn't discuss it. So that's the reason why I did discuss it. So now it's done. And peace.